I'm hoping that uh, this time that we were stuck at home, uh, you guys consecrated more to the Lord. Because uh, like our brother said, that uh, the times we're living in are, are frivolous times, right? We, uh, we long for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But sometimes we forget and we get so caught up in all these YouTube videos coming in and out. And we fail to realize how we're living our life with God, how our character is. So this morning, um, I'm going to emphasize on a particular apostle. And for that, uh, before I go ahead and uh, uh, read the word of God, I would like to kneel so that the Holy Spirit can use me and that he can uh, guide us into his, his study of the word today. So for all those that can, that can kneel, I'll go ahead and say a prayer here. Thank you. Dear Gracious Father, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. Thank you because you're able to give us uh, another day of life to come to worship you, to study your word, and for you to talk to us, Lord. I humbly uh, come to you so that you can forgive me for all iniquities, all sins. I'm not worthy to be up here, but I'm simply an instrument that you can use me, so I humbly ask that you use me today so that any person that's here today perhaps uh, is failing, perhaps needs more of you, that this message today may touch their heart and touch their mind so that coming out of here, we can say it was great to come to church today. I needed this message. So please, Lord, use me and talk to us today. Uh, we ask all this in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and... I invite you guys to open the, your Bibles to Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verses 10 and 14. Revelation 21, verses 10 and 14. The Word of God says, Revelation 21, verses 10 and 14. It says, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Here the Apostle John tells us that he sees the great city of God. New Jerusalem coming down and it contained the 12 tribes on the doors the 12 tribes of Israel and although Jacob had 12 sons one of them is left out do you guys know who was left out of that uh, the inheritance or or in one of these uh, doors of the, of the New Jerusalem Dan Dan was left out uh, in the names of the 12 tribes of Israel in, Re in Revelation 7, we can see all the names there, and Dan is not in that list. Uh, Joseph received double portion of the inheritance, and in Joseph, it was given to his son Manasseh, the tribe that was left out of Dan. So Joseph received double inheritance, and his son Manasseh took the place of Dan. So, out of the 12 one is left off the list. And it's interesting, as we read, that the city, the foundation, has the 12 names of the apostles. And it's very interesting because out of the 12 apostles, one is also left out. Do you guys know who that was? Judas, Judas right? Judas. Judas was left out. The match is perfect. Can you see? 
12 tribes of the 12 doors, one is left out. The foundations, 12 apostles, one gets left out, but another one takes his place. Now, the fact of being an Israelite does not guarantee us entry into the city of God. Not because I'm a direct descendant from Abraham. Uh, we count as an Israelite. In other words, not because I call myself a Christian am I going to heaven or do I have the privilege of going to heaven. Only those of the promise, only those who really entered into the covenant of faith and salvation through Christ gets to get to go to heaven. As we read, let's go to Galatians to confirm this. Galatians chapter 3. I will be putting up all the verses up here, but I encourage you to open your Bible so that we all can go in depth in this study. So Galatians 3 confirms this. And Galatians 3, 26 to 29, it reads, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as, a, as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen. So... When you accept Christ, uh, there's no difference now. There's no Greek, there's no Jew, male or female. If you accept Christ, you are, uh, you, are, you are of Christ, right? You are of Abraham's seed, is what it's saying here. And also, as I mentioned, in the foundations, there's 12 apostles here. You can see, this is just a, a diagram here. We can see in the New Jerusalem, we're going to be able to see the foundations have the names of the apostles. These 12 men were chosen by Jesus not because of what they were, but because of what they would become. Because Jesus knew their character defects. He knew these men. He knew how they were. And he chooses these, these, uh, these 12 apostles uh, because of the transforming grace of Christ. He would make them new men in Jesus Christ, right? And this is what he wants to do with each and every one of us today. Uh, Jesus wants to make us a new person. Uh, he wants to reflect. He wants us to reflect that character of Christ. And that's what he wants to do with us today. So the Lord chooses these 12 apostles, a special group of people, to form the new group of God, the new Jerusalem, I'm sorry, the new Israel. The new Israel, not the literal Israel. Because these 12 apostles... And these 12 apostles, all Christianity takes their name. Uh, in other words, the whole body of Christ is represented in these 12 apostles because of what they did, because of their character defects, their problems, their weaknesses, their setbacks, uh, even with their positive char characteristics, their achievements, we are all represented in them because of what they did, of what the testimony they gave us, is because you and I believe. This is why we have the Bible, right? Because of what they, te they, they saw, because of what they wrote. Their testimony is because of why we believe. And that is why we can see these 12 apostles having the foundation in this new Jerusalem. And in this morning, I want to emphasize and study a certain apostle. His name, Nathaniel, or Bartholomew. We tend to hear Paul, Peter, Judas mostly, right? We tend to hear out of all these apostles, John. But sometimes we, we, don't, we don't get to hear or study. Uh, the other apostles are kind of not mentioned. So this morning, uh, we're going to study the apostle Nathaniel. And I invite you guys to open in Matthew 10 to see the list of these apostles. Matthew 10, verses 1 through 4. Here it gives us the list of the, of the apostles that Jesus chose. So Matthew 10, verses 1 through 4, it reads, And when he called unto him his twelve disciples, 
He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labaeus, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So here we can see the, the list of the apostles. And if you compare this list with the list of Mark 10 and Luke 6, it gives us the same names. The only difference is in the uh, Apostle John, where the name of Bartholomew changes, and it's Nathaniel. So Nathaniel is the same as Bartholomew. Uh, in, the, in the Gospel of John, like I said, no, no Bartholomew is mentioned there. And we have this confirmation in the spirit of prophecy that Bartholomew and Nathaniel are the same person. Because basic, uh, simply, the name Bartholomew in Aramaic means the son of. Uh, for example, here Bartholomew, son of Ptolemy, uh, or the son of Pharaohs. Perhaps Ptolemy was his father's name, who knows? Or it was just a surname for the son of, Sor the son of Sorrows, uh, which his dad was probably a plower or a farmer. So in other words, we can see here, son in Aramaic, is, the translation is bar. So you can see here, bar. So son in Aramaic, son of, is bar. So bar, tome. So it's almost like a last name. For example, we have a last name. My name uh, Samuel Cortez. Back then, there was no last names. To di di uh, distinguish another, another Nathaniel from another Nathaniel, they would say the son of, for example, Eddie, the son of James, Eddie, the son of John. That's how they, um, they distinguish them from one Nathaniel from another. For example, we have a, an example here. James, son of Alphaeus, and the other James, son of Zebedee. So Bar, Tome, Bartholomew. Okay, well, now that we... Uh, Distinguished Nathaniel and Bartholomew are the same person. Nathaniel, or Bartholomew, is the only apostle in the New Testament in which there is no defect recorded. Uh, there are other apostles in, in which their names are only mentioned. We don't know anything about them, just like we read in the list. They're only their name is, is mentioned. But, Nathaniel's, but Nathaniel, no defects or no errors are mentioned or registered in the, in the Word of God. Now that doesn't mean that he was a sinner because there is no righteous, not one, correct? So that means that the Bible did register though that there was uh, no defect in him. And it's interesting to see that Jesus declared of this apostle when he saw him, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. How beautiful were that? Uh, how beautiful, right? So um, now Nathaniel is a symbol of Christ, and he also is an example of the 144,000, as we're going to see in this study more in depth. Nathaniel was an intimate friend of Philip, and they were from Bethsaida. Uh, this little town here, Bethsaida, is a little t small town, northern Galilee. This, these are recent pictures of how it looks, the ruins that they found. They were from Bethsaida, so they were intimate friends. They knew each other, just like the other apostles, uh, Peter, James, John, Philip, and Andrew. They were all from the same little town here, Bethsaida. And so, with further ado, uh, brethren, let's go to the story. It's very, very beautiful and very interesting. And it has a great, great uh, story for us. So let's go to John. John chapter 1. And we're going to begin the study of Nathaniel here. John chapter 1, verses 44 and 45. Let's see what it 
Bible says here, John chapter 1. The Word of God says, Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. In the verse prior to this, Jesus had caught Philip and told him, follow me. Now, Philip and Nathanael had gone to listen to John the Baptist. They gone together to listen to John the Baptist. And in the book, Desire of Ages, chapter, I'm sorry, uh, pages 139, it says, Philip called Nathanael. The latter had been among the throng when the Baptist pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God. Nathaniel was a disciple of John the Baptist. He had heard him preach. He was among the, the crowd when John the Baptist was speaking. And he was a student of prophecy, Nathaniel was. He knew that the day had come when God had to fulfill the prophecy sending the Messiah. Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks in chapter 9, when the Messiah would be anointed, was about to complete. They were in the exact same year. And John the Baptist was calling, uh, Behold, the Lamb of the God who take it away the sins. He was right there. John the Baptist was giving this tremendous sermon, and the prophecy was about to be fulfilled. However, when John the Baptist made the statement that Jesus, the Messiah, Nathaniel, as Nathaniel looked upon Jesus, he was disappointed. Could this man, could this man who bore the marks of toil and poverty be the Messiah? Nathaniel was excited. The prophecy was about to be completed. And when John points out the Messiah, he looks and he's disappointed. You could see Jesus, a poor man with sandals, dirty. He didn't look anything special, a carpenter. And Nathaniel was disappointed. This, this man right here? Yet Nathaniel could not decide to reject Jesus, for the message of John had brought conviction to his heart. John the Baptist had given a tremendous sermon pointing out the, the completion of this prophecy. And this sermon had touched Nathaniel's heart. He knew that John the Baptist was a prophet. And John the Baptist pointed out this man as the Messiah. And Nathaniel couldn't reject it. I know John. He's telling the truth. But, but wow, could this man be the Messiah? He withdrew to study this matter deeply. He left. You know, he wanted to know. He wanted to, to know if this man was the, the Messiah. So he went to go study the scriptures more thoroughly. And it keeps going on the same, on the same page. At the time when Philip called him, Nathanael had withdrawn to a quiet grove to meditate upon the announcement of John and the prophecies concerning the Messiah. Now, brothers and sisters, as I mentioned, that Nathanael is an example of the 144,000. Here we see, look at the correct characteristics of this man. It says that he was a student of what? Or a studious person of what? The prophecies. Now, the modern Nathanaels, what do we have to be studying? prophecies, right? Uh, he was a, a, a studious uh, person of the first advent of Messiah. He wanted to know. He was studying these prophecies. Now, we have to be studying uh, the second advent of Christ because we see the signs all around, right? And so it keeps going. It says, he prayed that if the announcement by John was the deliverer, it might be made known to him. And the Holy Spirit rested upon him with assurance that God had visited his people and raised up a horn of salvation for them. He asked God. He, went to, he, he withdrew, and he went to go pray, and he was asking, Lord, show me. I want to know if this man is a deliverer. He was praying. He wanted to know. And it keeps saying, Philip knew that his friend was searching the prophecies, and while Nathaniel was praying under a fig tree, Philip discovered his retreat. They had often prayed together, in this secluded spot, hidden 
by the foliage. How beautiful, right? He retreats. He wants to know if this man, this poor man that I just saw, Lord, show me. I want to know. Show me. And while he's there uh, under the foliage, while no one bothered him, he had a secluded place under a fig tree. He was pouring out his heart to the Lord. Show me, Lord. I want to know. Um, great example for us, right? He was a studious a person of the prophecies. And so for us, we must be doing that also, studying what, what concerns the advent of, of, our, of our Messiah, second advent of Jesus. And so in verse 45, we keep reading the story. Uh, verses 45 and 46, it says, Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, when Nathanael was praying under this fig tree, Philip comes running to him. Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son, jo the son of Joseph. Now, Philip touched this point. Uh, Nathanael was praying, and here comes Philip, and he touches this point, what he wanted to know. When, when he, what he wanted to know. This is the one who Moses wrote, who all the Old Testament speaks of. And so Philip touches Nathanael's point here. But something interesting happened. When Philip mentioned Nazareth, the doubt entered in Nathanael. And Nathanael said unto him, can there anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Come and take a look. In other words, can something good come out of San Bernardino? <laughs> pretty, pretty, you know, something's got to think about. Wow, you know. Um, and Philip told him, Come and see. Convince yourself. Come and see you for yourself like I did, you know. And, and when Philip arrived at the hidden place under the, under the fig tree, and by the way, have you guys seen fig trees? They're, they're very large. This is just a small one, but they grow very, very large. And the leaves kind of hang down. Uh, the branches are, are long and they hang down. And it, it almost acts like a little cave or like somewhere you can hide. Like, you know, covered by the foliage. You can go in there and, and you can find a little hiding spot. And this was Nathaniel's little hiding spot under a fig tree. And when Philip said, we have found him of whom Moses wrote and the prophets. He was praying, you know, God, tell me, show me, show me. I want to know. And here comes Philip and tells him that they had found him. But Philip's faith was wavering. He gave him that certain doubt by mentoring Nazareth. And although Philip um, was the one who looked for Nathaniel, although one he, was, he went to go find him at the same time, he became a stumbling block because he, he, he told him, you know, of Nazareth. He gave, him that, he gave him that little doubt, you know. And nowadays, brothers, how many brothers and sisters bring others to Christ? Uh, they bring them to the feet of Christ, but then later they fall back or they fall out, and they become stumbling blocks, you know. They, they try to get them out. These same people that brought you to Christ later on, they fall out, and they, and they become stumbling blocks, you know. And so this is kind of like this, what Philip was kind of doing without intentionally knowing it, uh, becoming a stumbling block. And so it keeps reading in Desire of Ages. The message, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, seemed to Nathanael a direct answer to his prayer. But Philip had yet a trembling faith. He added doubtfully, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, again, Prejudice arose in Nathaniel's heart. He exclaimed, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Now, Nazareth was a proverbial town for its evil. There was prostitution. There was uh, bad life. There was poverty. Uh, one of the smallest or poorest, uh, I'm sorry, one of the poorest villages in northern Galilee. And so he asked, Can anything good come out of this place? And now the, the story keeps going. Uh, Philip entered into no controversy, and he said, come and see. And now, here comes the most wonderful thing of the story. In verse 49, uh, our story keeps reading, and it says, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. 
Can you imagine this statement coming from Jesus? How, how, would I how would I love that Jesus would talk to me that way? When Jesus would see me, look, there's a true Israelite with no guile. What would Jesus say of us today if he's seen us, you know? Uh, what recommendation coming from one that knows the hearts, right? One that knows the mind, can read the emotions. Uh, here is a true Israelite, Jesus said, in whom there is no deception. This is a tremendous recommendation. A man without guile, in other words, deception, without hypocrisy, without cheating, without a double face, without uh, stabbing in the back, right? A pure man who did not think evil. One did not act on strange impulses. One that when you talk to him doesn't analyze you when you're talking to him. Have you ever met people or done it yourself when you're talking to somebody and you're already thinking in your head, man, this guy's out of his mind. Man, what's wrong with this guy? Or man, this guy stinks. Have you guys met people that way or even yourself did that when you speak to somebody? Well, here comes a man that says there was no guile found in him. This was Nathaniel, a true Israelite. Now, the same thing of Nathaniel is the same thing that is said of Jesus. In Peter, First uh, Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, here Peter describes Jesus. The same things that were said of Nathaniel is said of Jesus, and it reads, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did what? No sin, neither what? Was guile found in his mouth. Nathaniel, a symbol of Jesus Christ, in which guile was not found in his mouth. A true Israelite. And this is the main characteristic of the 144,000. In Revelation 14, Revelation 14, verses 1 through 5, here we see a description of the 144,000, the true Israelites. And it reads, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount of Zion, and with him in 140 and 4,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads, and I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harps harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn the song but the 144,000, which were the redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they in which follow the Lamb whithsoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. And the key verse, verse 5, And in their mouth was found what? No guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. The true Israelites indeed. Guile was not found in their mouth. And the Apostle James declares, in James 3, James 3, verse, four, verse 2, it declares, sometimes we, re we hear or we read that God calls us to be perfect, but sometimes we don't realize, how can I become perfect? What is that? Well, James 3, verse 2, gives us a very, very special hint. It says, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. He, does not, he who does not offend with word is a perfect man. And, and who can be out of guilt here, huh? Everybody offends, right? Everybody says something mean sometimes, right? And who can be a perfect man? If you can, if you can refrain your mouth, your words, it says here you, you become a perfect man. Who can master his tongue does not offend because the problem always comes from the mouth. For out of the abundance of the heart speaketh what? The heart or the mouth. Matthew 12, 34. 
the 144,000 are spotless and without guile, without deception, without lies, the true Israelites. Now, the true Israelites are not the descendants of Israel, literal Israel, in the flesh, as we've seen in, in Galatians. Uh, in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, it declares this. Romans chapter 9, verses 6 and 8, it says, Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall, they, shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are accounted for the seed. So not because you're a literal descendant of Israel or you, you were born over there, you're considered in the word of God a true Israelite. Not because we're descendants, right, of Israel, are we true Israelites. And so here, a true Israelite, Nathaniel, is seen. And Jesus says there was no guile found in his mouth because there was a lot of people there. There could have been, there was a lot of Israelites. There was a lot of Jewish people there. Uh, there was a lot of descendants uh, of Israel, but they were not true Israelites like Nathaniel was. Uh, because they are, they, uh, Nathaniel was recognized by the way he was, by his mouth, by the way he acted. And brothers, I don't know how I'm going to tell you, but I have to tell you that one of the prevailing sins in Adventism today is the sin, or in our church, is the sin of gossip. Always the talking bad about others. Always the foul language, the mouth. Because there's brethren that say, you eat meat? No, I don't eat meat. I'm a vegetarian. I'm a vegan. But it turns out, after the sermon, after church is over, they go home, and they eat the pastor alive. And they eat the, they eat the speaker alive. And they eat the elder alive, or the brother, or the sister. This is terrible. Very terrible. And they say they're vegetarian. <laughs> the word of God says that if there's something that God hates, he detests, is a lying mouth. In Proverbs verse, uh, chapter 6, and you, I recommend you guys highlight this passage here. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Verses 16 through 19. It says. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yes, yeah, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look. A lying tongue. And hands that shed innocent blood. God detests. God hates a lying tongue. Now let's keep reading. Because this, this, this topic here. Uh, it mentions it four times. The lying with the mouth is related four times in this passage here. It says, These six things doth the Lord hate, and seven are an abomination to him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a dirty mind, mind that deviseth wicked imaginations or dirty thoughts, a mind that's constantly thinking bad or, or dirty. This is what God hates. And that is why Christ said in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart because what? They will see God. A clean-minded person. So that's why, brethren, the Lord tells us to guard the avenues of the soul. Some people say, Oh, what's, what's wrong with me going to the movies? What's wrong with me watching television? What's wrong with me listening to that? Or what's wrong with me watching this YouTube video? Don't we realize that that's what's dirtying our minds? Don't we realize that that's what's affecting the way we think and what we, what we speak or what we say? Uh, let's keep reading here. Uh, verse, verse 19. And what else does God hate? A false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among the brethren. 
It repeats it again. First, the lying tongue, and then now a false witness, and a speaking lies, and one that soweth discord among brethren. And how do you sow discord among brethren? Gossiping, right? Lying, talking bad about others. Four times it mentions this. And I think it's very serious, don't you think? That, that God hates all this. And that's not for nothing that the book of Revelation, closing the, the Bible registry in chapter 22, God says this, Revelation 22. Revelation 22 Verses 15, it says, For without are dogs, and sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Is it going to be that there's not going to be any little chihuahuas or, or dog hounds on earth, on, 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 in heaven? No, it's not talking about that. The dogs here refers to the wicked to the sodomites, to the homosexuals, and to all the apostates that deviate from God's commandments, and also the false pastors. Isaiah 56, 10, and 11, God calls them dogs. So very clearly it says here, the ones that loveth and maketh a lie. And also in Revelation 21, just turning the page back one, one. Uh, Revelation 21, verses 7 and 8, it reads, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, the unbelieving, and the abominable, and the murderers, and the whoremongers, and the sorcerers, and the idolaters, and what? All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. Things that the Lord hates. A lying mouth. Now if there was a characteristic of Nathaniel was that he had a pure heart and a clean mouth. He never spoke badly about others. And even the, the scriptures register or say that he said from Nazareth? Did something good come out of Nazareth? The true Israelite, the one that didn't speak guile, was able to come to judge Christ. But he didn't say it because he was judging. It was because Nazareth was a previous uh, known uh, town that was, was bad and was wicked. And so can you imagine someone that was pure uh, to say that? How were the unpure or the other people, how would they speak, you know? And so Jesus knew his heart. Uh, he knew that Nathaniel wasn't saying that to, to criticize. He knew that Nazareth had a bad reputation. And, and so it was hard for Nathaniel to accept Jesus coming from Nazareth. But now the Lord gives him the sign that he was looking for. Back to our story in John 1, verses 48. When Jesus said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile, uh, verse 48, it reads, John 1, 48, back to our story, it reads, Nathanael said unto him, Whence now is thou at me? In other words, from where do you know me? How can you have that opinion of me if we never met? How can you know whether I am a true Israelite or not if, if this is the first time we speak? How do you know me? From where do you know me? And Jesus replied and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Wow, isn't that beautiful? I don't know if you guys comprehend the whole story of what happened. Brothers, this is something wonderful for you and me because the, Lord of the, uh, the eyes of the Lord are upon God's children wherever we are. We can be hiding under a foliage. We can be anywhere we are. And God sees us. He has his eyes upon us. Uh, no matter where we hide, where we are, the Lord can read our minds. He can read our hearts. He knows what's inside of us. Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. For Nathaniel, this was enough. 
the divine spirit had given him the answer he was looking for. First, here comes Philip running. Hey, we found the Messiah. As he was praying, that was one sign that he gave him. That was con one confirmation when he was on his knees praying, pouring out his heart. God, show me. Is this guy, is this man the deliverer? Philip comes and tells him, we found the Messiah. But now Jesus tells him, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Uh, and the spirit of prophecy keeps saying, uh, chat, uh, Desire of Ages, page 140. It was enough. The divine spirit had borne witness to Nathaniel in his solit solitary prayer under the fig tree, now spoke to him in the words of Jesus. Though in doubt and yielding somewhat to prejudice, Nathaniel had come to Christ with an honest desire of truth, and now his desire was met. His faith went beyond that one of went beyond that of the one who had brought him to Jesus. Nathaniel's faith was much greater than the Philip himself who came to tell him he found Jesus. And in John 1, 49, uh, back to our story, it says, what did Nathaniel respond? And Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. In this statement, Nathaniel was telling Jesus that you were the true God, the Son of God, because only God can read the thoughts. Imagine he hadn't even never seen Jesus uh, uh, prior to that. And now here comes this man telling him that he saw him when he was under the fig tree. And to tell him the King of Israel or the Son of God, this was making him equal to God. And he answered his prayer right there, right in front of him. He knew that only God could read his mind. And read the heart. And when Jesus told him, when you were under the fig tree and I saw you, he knew that God himself was right in front of his presence. And then he says, you are the king of Israel. Do you guys understand what he was calling him? The king of Israel? This is one of God's titles in the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 44, it says, and by the way, every Jewish boy... When he turns 13, he celebrates a special ceremony, which is called the Bar Mitzvah. You guys know what the Bar Mitzvah is? In this ceremony, uh, when a Jewish boy turns 13, this is very special to them. Because when they turn 13, this is of legal age. They have the ceremony, the, the Bar Mitzvah. And in this ceremony, every Jewish child is considered an adult and when they celebrate this they have the privilege of going into the synagogue to read with the adults so every child to participate or to have this ceremony they must be able to recite Deuteronomy 6 what it's called the Shema uh, in other words in De Deuteronomy 6 hear O Israel the Lord our God is one Lord they have to be able to recite that whole Deuteron Deuteronomy 6 in order to, to celebrate this uh, ceremony for them. But not also Deuteronomy 6, they also must memorize Isaiah 42, Isaiah 43, and Isaiah 44. So all Jew and all Israelite, they know this by heart. And in Isaiah 44, verse 6, it says, Thus saith the Lord, the what? The King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. So Nathaniel is telling here, the king of Israel, he knew this passage by heart. He knew this because he was a devout Jew. He knew this by heart, so he knew this by memory. And remember that, that, that the Jewish people didn't have a king back then. Uh, they were under the dominion of the Romans, so their, their king was God. And here he's telling Jesus, the king of Israel. Very beautiful. And so they re didn't recognize anyone else as a king, only God. And so he's telling him, the king of Israel. This was uh, the greatest statement that someone could make. And Peter, he made the same declaration in Matthew 16. Uh, right, at the, right at the end of Christ's ministry, after being three and a half years with Christ, Peter, he made the same statement. Uh, just before Jesus was going to be crucified, uh, 
Jesus tells them in Matthew 16, Who do you say that I am? In Matthew 16, verses 14 and 17, it says, And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist. Here, here is uh, Jesus asking them, who do, you, who do you say that I am? Some said John the Baptist. Some, Elias. And others, Jeremiah's, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barona, for flesh and blood had not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. For Peter to have said this declaration, the Son of God, it's because God revealed it to him. But here we have a man who had never seen Jesus, who meets Jesus for the first time, Nathaniel, and Nathaniel tells him the same thing in his first encounter with the Lord. How wonderful, right? The Holy Spirit had revealed to Nathaniel. Now, Nathaniel, brothers and sisters, as I said, is an example of the 144,000. Uh, who truly were converted. Nathaniel was already a converted man, even before, even before he came to Jesus. Even before seeing Jesus, he was already converted. Before seeing him personally, because Nathaniel was a true Israelite in whom there was no deception in his mouth. Now, when the Lord Jesus transforms our hearts, he makes us a different person. He, he transforms our characters, and he purifies it. Because the Holy Spirit is not given to those who have a lying tongue. The Holy Spirit is not given to those who live a life of hypocrisy. The Holy Spirit is not given to those who live a double life of lies. And the Holy Spirit is not given to those to speak gibberish in tongues. So the Holy Spirit is given to those who have no guile in their mouth who have no lying deceptions in their mouth. And when the Holy Spirit or the seal of the living God is placed or shall be placed upon the forehead of all those that, cho that, that are chosen among the Israel of God today, the spirit of prophecy categorically declares in Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, page 214, not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. It is left with us to remedy the defects in our character to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. Who's it left with? It's left to us. Who's got to do it? We have to allow God to come into our lives and cleanse us. I cannot cleanse myself. I cannot change because there's people that say, oh, I can't, I can't do that. I can't change. This is who I am. And if this is who I am, God has to accept me like that. I can't change. This is who I am. For those who think that way, uh, they're going to come to a very, very sad disappointment that there will be no seal of the living God placed upon their forehead. So, in such a way... We will reflect the character of Christ that it will be said of us. Here is a true Israelite indeed, in which was no found, no guile, no deception. And that is what is going to be said of the 144,000. It's impossible for man to change. We can't do it on our own. But we have to surrender to, to, to the Lord. Uh, can one who is used to lying, deceiving people, backstabbing, having a foul mouth, a bad language, one that's used to not telling the truth, can he change? No, he can't. Man cannot change. But there is a God in heaven who can change us, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Come to him, my brethren. Come to him, and he'll give you a clean mouth. He will give you that change of character that we all need. Long time ago, and Nathaniel knew this passage as well, that the Lord described who was going to be in the holy mount of God. Those people found in Psalms 15, and this is the Psalms of the 144,000. Psalms 15, verses 1 through 3, it reads, Lord, 
Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Four times. Declares this four times. Who will be with the 144,000 and with the lamb on the holy hill? He who is clean of heart and hands and mind and mouth. He who does not slander with his tongue and speaks ill of his neighbor. If you want to be in that group, if you want to be in that holy hill of God, we need to ask the Lord to cleanse us today. We get caught up in what's going on. This virus this, this virus that. That we fail to realize the way we are. We fail to realize how we are with others. We fail to realize how, how bad we're talking about other people. What's it good that we know the prophecies? What's it good that we know the signs of the times when our character is very horrible? So my lesson for today, my brethren, is that let's pray to God that we can become true Israelites indeed. Amen? Amen. Uh, praise the Lord. So I want to end with a prayer. Uh, I will go ahead and kneel, whoever can kneel with me, and we'll ask the Lord to help us with our character uh, so that we can be ready for the return of our, our Lord. Dear Gracious Father, thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. Thank you. Thank you because your word is true. It's simple that a child can understand. Thank you because we were able to come here today. Perhaps you brought somebody that needed to hear this. Perhaps we're stumbling in some character defects. We all are, Lord. I personally am not an exception. So I thank you for speaking clearly to us and your Holy Spirit may find a way in each and everyone's heart here today that coming out of here we can reflect on the way we're living, how we're speaking, how we're thinking. Take control of all our emotions, of all our thoughts, of all our actions, because we want to see you come in the clouds of glory. And those that have any defilement, any spot or wrinkle, will be left out of the kingdom of the Lord. So, Lord, my prayer is that nobody here is left out, that everyone takes consideration deeply and work on their salvation with trembling, because the signs are there. You're coming soon, Lord. So help us. Help us change our character starting today. Be with us the rest of your holy Sabbath, and that we may walk righteously and not transgress any hour or minute of this holy day. You deserve every attention and every communication and connection with you in our minds. So remove all distractions, all iniquity from us, Lord. And so as we study Nathaniel and we understand those 12 foundations and why they are there, Lord, help us. Help us to reflect the character of Christ. Thank you once again because you reprove the people you love. And we ask this all and thanks in the glorious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.